Now, I started out by saying that the terms global city and competitive city are not synonymous. There is a concern in Singapore, I know, that if there's too much redistribution, if there's too much of a commitment to greater equity, uh, that this will reduce growth. Uh, there's also a concern that Singapore as a city state is limited in its capabilities. However, I would argue that there are great advantages to being a city state. They far outweigh uh, the disadvantages. Uh, if you take a look at New York City right now, which has a new mayor who's trying to, uh, who's committed to greater equity, uh, well, he finds that he has to go to the New York State Legislature uh, to do almost anything. He cannot raise taxes uh, without the permission of the state legislature. And so what you find in countries uh, which have major cities is there tends to be a conservative element in the countryside uh, which opposes uh, people within the cities uh, who uh, want to have greater uh, redistribution. And in particular, in uh, developing countries, there tends to be a rural landowning class, uh, which is a very conservative element uh, within the country. Uh, Singapore, on the other hand, has control over immigration, control over its own revenues, control over its own expenditures, uh, which virtually any mayor of almost any other city would give their right and left arms in order to get. So uh, I've just briefly sketched out what I mean by a global city, uh, that a competitive city has perhaps certain aspects of being a global city, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, a just city is characterized what, by what in my book called the just city. I said that there were three principles uh, that uh, define a just city. And by this, I don't mean a good city, which incorporates more. But a just city is one that has democracy, diversity, and equity. So uh, what are the elements that would then make up these three principles? Uh, one is public participation. And public participation means more than just uh, surveying people and saying how many people are in favor of this or getting miscellaneous comments, but it actually uh, involves participation through channels uh, that are involved in what's called often civil society, that is organized interests that are able to um, make their views known. Uh, it also involves, in terms of diversity, mixed neighborhoods. Uh, now, Singapore has been, of course, very committed, and Norman will talk about this more, uh, to the ethnic integration policy and to having uh, HDB housing throughout the city. Uh, diversity also means tolerance of the other. Uh, and I think that this is, uh, in general, a uh, characteristic of Singapore. Uh, public housing is an aspect of uh, having greater equity uh, that uh, inevitably, uh, in every city that ex has existed historically, uh, that uh, housing for low-income people requires a subsidy. Uh, there is no way that markets produce low-income housing except with very high levels of crowding. Uh, so we saw in the 19th century in Europe uh, and in the United States so-called tenement reform, uh, which was an effort largely to use housing codes uh, to limit the amount of housing and to require uh, better sanitation uh, in, uh, in places where low-income people live. Uh, but the problem with that is once you enforce rules, then it becomes much more expensive to provide the housing and the earnings that uh, poor people get are insufficient uh, to support decent housing. So it's only with a public subsidy that we can have adequate housing for the whole population. So public housing and then also inexpensive transportation, uh, that uh, these are the two elements uh, which really uh, depend on a public uh, involvement, a governmental involvement, uh, in order to produce a more equitable city. Uh, the question for Singapore, and this is where I'm going to stop talking, is whether it can have both, whether it can have both uh, competitiveness and uh, the principles of a just city, democracy, diversity, and equity.